so yes, as uh, Tim said, I'm Sarah Stagg. I'm um, digital director at the Rug Company. Uh, my background is very different from my new role. So I've been at the Rug Company for six months. Previously, I was in kind of mass market department store retailing. Um, so it's a significant shift for me in terms of working in a niche product, moving to the luxury sector and working somewhere where digital is really a very small proportion of the sales currently. And it's, it's um, further behind in its digital transformation journey. So um, I will hopefully talk about how um, it's, it's a bit different about how we talk about digital. And um, really, we don't think about um, the final transaction um, channel as much as I historically have been used to. But anyway, without further ado, I'm going to start just giving a bit of background. I don't know how many people know about the rug company, probably not many, um, but it's a fascinating brand. So I wanted to share a bit about it before we start properly. Um, so it's um, 20 years old, um, founded by husband and wife um, from London. Um, it was really born out of their passion for, um, for creativity, for quality, for design, for craftsmanship, and for service. Um, it's really um, it's split half UK, half US. It's very international. Um, franchises around the world. Um, and it's the leading name in contemporary rugs, in contemporary luxury rugs in the world. Um, the craftsmanship is probably the, the most fascinating part of the story of the brand. Um, it's, um, they're all handmade in Nepal. It's an age-old tradition passed down by generations, and each one is really um, totally unique and a, and a complete work of art. Um, it's, um, it, everything is, is extremely high quality, um, and the time it takes and the number of people involved in each rug is, is really quite astounding. So it takes about 14 weeks per rug to make, and that could be up to six people um, working on it. Um, the rug company also um, is therefore quite a significant um, impact on the Nepalese economy as, as a whole, and it um, is part of something called Good Weave, um, which really makes sure that we are uh, making a positive impact in the economy and in all of the traditions surrounding the techniques. The other very unique point about the rug company is we have a number of designer collaborations. Um, so we work with 52 um, of the world's leading designers, um, including Alexander McQueen, Paul Smith, Vivian Westwood, etc. So um, it's um, it's a big, it's a very important part of the brand. There there aren't um, rug, other rug companies that work with with the designers, um, and so so it's highly unique that point. The other interesting part is that about 50% of the sales are custom rugs, so you can customize any design you see, the shape, the color, the size the qualities, the materials, however you want it. So it's a, it's a highly service-led organization with all the custom and bespoke that we do. So I'm going to play it just a um, short video just to give you a little bit of insight into the brand further.
So y you can see I have a, um, a really fascinating and amazing job to be able to um, talk to people about this process and about the product. Um, and, and really the challenge is making sure that we get these USPs across in a digital way um, to ensure that we are um, communicating the brand message effectively. When I joined um, six months ago, it was really, um, a, and they would, they would say themselves, ready for the transformation, quite a traditional mindset in terms of their marketing spend being predominantly in print. Um, really, their, their main um, channel of communication was through a catalogue that is absolutely beautiful. It looks like a coffee table book. Um, it's hard-backed, and it's about this thick, um, and absolutely beautiful. And, and that was their main communication channel and sales channel, if you like. Um, and, and what we really did was make sure that the business was understanding the, how the world is moving and some of the trends that we're seeing in 2018 and making the most of it. So clearly, digital engagement becomes paramount. I don't need to tell anyone here that, that that's why we're all here. Um, investment in proven social platforms because they're so critical for luxury brands and for brand awareness. Video is really at the forefront and is particularly important for our storytelling um, because of the, um, the huge heritage of the brand and the craftsmanship and the story behind it. Um, we need to look at personalization um, critically because we are a business that has a small number of transactions, a small number of customers with a high average order value. So we need to make sure that the service and, and we're talking to each person um, in the right way. Um, email newsletters become the new brand magazine. I think that's really interesting. Um, copywriting and storytelling will, are critical for us. Influencer marketing is, is really interesting for us in terms of reach and, and really moving from that print marketing background into identifying people in our industry that makes sense to work with. Um, because we are not only B2C, so about 50% of the business is B2C, 50% is interior designers in the UK. In the US, it's more like 90% interior designers, which is really interesting. Um, in the US, it's every, in the US everyone, it's, everyone will say they work with an interior designer. It's very prestigious to have an interior designer. In the UK, everyone pretends they don't. Um, so there's some really interesting differences there. Um, and remarketing, I think, is, 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 is roaring back. And again, kind of smart measurement and data-driven uh, is critical as it is for anyone else. Um, so we looked at the marketing budgets as well as the investment in digital. And um, this was a report by McKinsey that really said that luxury brands are re reallocating budgets to digital and events, but not rapidly enough. So you can look at some of these um, digital brands, and it was a great comparison for us. Um, Burberry probably being the one that is um, the most balanced between digital print and, um, and events. Um, so we really said that our marketing investment should be at least 30% digital, um, which was a, hu a huge move for these guys who had um, never spent money on PPC before. We also said that customer insight um, should be at the forefront. So we did some trade breakfasts. We did a number of surveys to try and understand how the interiors industry is changing. It's very different for me from my fashion background. Um, so it was, it was really interesting and, um, to understand a bit more about the changes in interior design. So they said to us that they used to go shopping with clients um, they used to, apparently, if you had an interior designer, you would go to the shops or you'd go to Chelsea Design Centre or wherever on a Saturday and you'd go around the shops and look at things you like. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, the interior designers will build Pinterest boards. They'll share them with clients. Cl clients will add to the Pinterest board. It's, it's much more digitally led. Um, conversations don't happen face to face anymore as clients have very little time. A lot of interior designers now work just remotely um, over email, over WhatsApp, over FaceTime. Um, and also, um, clients f are more empowered to do it themselves. So interior designers really have to understand how they're adding value to that relationship. And we have to, because interior designers are such a big part of our customers, we have to help them and work out how do we help them add value to the relationship with their end consumer. We also ask customers, you know, which channel do you engage with the most for inspiration? And Instagram came out the highest by, by, by far, um, way, above, um, way above the catalog, way above print. Um, and um, it was Instagram, Pinterest. Um, and so we knew that we needed to identify influencers. We, needed, we need to look at paid social. 
um, and we needed to perhaps just slim down the investment in some of the more traditional channels. We also, and, and part of this was all part of the cultural change to be data-led, to do user testing, to change mindsets. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the, and, and, uh, and mainstream retailers do this, but we do the same. So um, if a sale comes in online and that client is already in the database and they have a salesperson already associated, associated to them, the sale online will be associated to that store salesperson so that the store salespeople don't feel like they're losing sales to online. We really wanted to make sure that it was not a competitor to them. Um, and then we also um, really invested in a lot of our customer services because it didn't really exist um, in any real way, in a centralized way, because it was very store-led. So we now have a, um, a customer services team who are really focused on service. And then we focus on the website. So we re-platformed to Magento 2. We totally redesigned it. We made it responsive, all of the standard things that you would expect. We did it really fast, um, and, um, and it's what you see today. We wanted to hero the product because, of course, that's the total asset here. We wanted to be really, s we wanted to make sure we could tell our story about our brand. We wanted to guide the user because it's a high purchase value and therefore we had to make sure the steps were clear and they felt reassured. Um, we wanted to be on the user's terms um, and we also wanted to add surprise and delight because we're a luxury brand and everything we do has to be absolutely beautiful. And then we, we identified the digital objectives and um, your driving online sales is, is almost bottom of the list. We are not interested in driving direct sales. We're much more interested in driving people into the showrooms um, or driving people online to speak to customer services or to interact with content or to spend longer on site or to read the blog or to read a video. We don't really want them going to check out for a while because it's a six-month purchase cycle. It's really long. It needs a number of touch points, and they have to know the brand. Um, so controversially, we don't want them to go to checkout. And I, I mean, I say that lightly, it would be it's absolutely fantastic when they do. Um, but the chances are that um, they are more likely to go to checkout if we make sure that they have engaged with the brand in a meaningful way um, beforehand. We also invested in all of the um, we also invest in, in all the digital marketing opportunities. And this is to the spending, making sure we're spending at least 30% of the marketing budget through digital, um, and that is both to drive traffic to the store and to drive traffic to the web. Um, and um, we promote our blog posts. We spend a lot, of, a lot of time and effort promoting our content rather than just heavy sales messages. Um, and um, we make sure that it's all, it's all optimized for international markets, and um, we talk to trade as much as we talk to our B2C customers. Interestingly, the website has a separate trade login. So if you're an interior designer and you have an account with us, you can log in to the, to the trade area of the website and you'll see all the trade, the pricing with trade discounts. Um, and you will see um, exclusive products. You'll ex see exclusive content. Um, and so again, we're really trying to drive that. Um, we're trying to add value for the, for the trade clients. Um, and this is the part that took a long time for my to get my head around coming from um, coming from a um, from a fashion background you <laughs> and you can't really see it in the slides um, but the the same hierarchy there's two buttons that have the same hierarchy on the page and one is add to bag and the other one next door to it says try at home um, and this was a huge debate in terms of you know, surely we want the add to bag button to be more prominent than the try at home button. But actually, we know that if so we um, have a service where you can try any of our rugs at home for a week for free, we'll, we'll ship it to you. You can return it if you don't like it at the end. And it's a great way. We know once we've got the rug into a customer's household, um, into their house, then, then they're likely to purchase it. Um, so actually, we would rather that they tried it at home um, because the conversion rate once they've selected that button is much higher than someone who is just doing a flat purchase. Um, so you have this strange situation for, a, for an e-commerce brand where um, the commerce button has something that's competing with it at the same hierarchy. Um, 
but all of these actions that are driving customers to store, driving customers to get their products at home are, are really important to us. We also um, have a huge amount of content on there as part of the storytelling because we want people to spend longer. Um, our time on site uh, from the old website to the new website is up 50%, so um, people spend um, three minutes, um, more than three minutes on the site, which is, which is really good. Um, and um, we'll build out those, those pages further. Um, and then we did, we did lots of things to maximize online sales and to maximize conversion rate, do not get me wrong. Um, we made sure that all of the global stock is shown on any website. So because of the high purchase value, it, it, we modeled it and it makes sense to, for, someone to for us to ship a rug from the United States stock pool to fulfill a UK order, et cetera. So um, we managed to double inventory on the website. Um, and we also do lots of things like out of stock alerts, et cetera, to make sure that our stock is working hard for us. And then finally, um, we, did, we did a lot around getting the basics right in terms of speed optimization, um, speed, security, stability, um, customer service, and user testing. Um, because we want to make sure that we know our customers and know what they want to do and know why they're shopping with us and how we can make their lives easier. So there's a, um, a huge focus to um, make sure that we're continually improving the customer service as there, as there should be at any, at any retail brand. Um, but we're making sure that it sits right at the heart of everything that we do. So that's it. That's a bit about the rug company. Um, I, hope, I hope you found it interesting getting to know maybe a new brand um, and also all of the, the key drivers for our digital initiatives. So thank you. So I'm going to, um, I think we've got a couple of microphones uh, we can put out there. Hands up in the air. Can you tell us who you are and then your question, please? Uh, gentleman here, um, if we could get a microphone there. And the rest of you will be thinking of questions for in a minute. Hi, uh, Elliot. Uh, quick question. Sorry, you where are you from, Elliot? <coughs> uh, sorry, I'm from a consultancy called PMC. Thanks. Um, so you are about trying to drive people to your showroom through digitalization. How are you then utilizing digital digitalization within your stores, within your showrooms, to get the maximum, maximum of both? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so um, we do a few things, um, things that you'd expect, like we have digital screens that show great content. Um, we have iPads so that customers can show um, the rugs that they can see in various settings um, within homes because we've got all the beautiful room shots. Um, so um, a customer will be going through what we call the stack of rugs and flipping the stack and showing them various designs. And we can show them each rug in various room settings. Um, we can also talk about the techniques within it and the wool and the materials used because all of that details on the website that the salesperson can use. Um, and there's various videos, et cetera. So there's lots of content that can happen in the showroom. We also build wish lists when we're with the customers on the website in the showroom. So we make sure it's a big data capture point for us. Um, and so we will ask if they are, um, if they have an account on the website. If not, we'll say we'll offer to sign them up for one because then we can add all the products that they've liked in the showroom to their wish list. And when they get home, it's all there for them um, because um, people like um, to know a lot about the technical specifications of rugs, um, and you can. Um, and what we used to do was send PDFs of um, of of these, and it, it's, we know it's much nicer to send links to the product. So we bu build them wish lists to share. We'll offer to sign them up to our newsletters. Um, so it's also a big data capture point for us. Hope just, that helps. Just to build on that, then, um, are you using quite a, a big CRM? to map that customer journey from the point at which you pick them up on a digital channel, you, you then capture some data in store, you're using direct mail in the mix as well. What does that customer journey look like? Yes, I'd love to say that we have kind of enterprise level, cutting edge um, ERP that does all of that for us, and, and sadly that just isn't the case. Um, but we will, we're working on it. Um, but in the meantime, we're in the privileged, um, um, it, it's easier for us because we're low transaction, high order, average order value. Um, that we are able to follow journeys through quite literally on sometimes a kind of one-to-one -one basis. So we can, 
we can see it go through. Um, so um, we um, and we also tag. So if somebody we someone registers for a trade account online, that person is tagged as um, as um, as being generated from the web. The origin is the web. So then we know when we run sales reports that this person origi or originated from the website, um, and we know we've got to do 200 percent more sales in showrooms than we do directly online. Um, so it's really important for us that those touch points are, are really easy and that we have ways to, to report on that activity. Great, thank you. Um, another question from the floor then. Um, if you could put your hand up and tell us who you are and where you're from. Lady at the back there. Hi, uh, I, I am Priyanjali working with Amazon Business as a product manager. So uh, my question is on um, that when you employed this new digital strategy, for the brand, how do you measure customer satisfaction or happiness with the brand? And, and did it increase? And what are the kind of parameters apart from average order value or sales, which are very uh, very upfront to measure? But, but these kind of nuances where customers or um, interior designers are engaging more with your brand, how do you measure that? Yeah. Um, so um, where to start? So um, at the moment we do it um, on a more ad hoc basis. Um, so we do we take quali qualitative measures um, and more quantitative measures, but um, through survey panels, focus groups, etc., to see where the movement has come from. Um, we will be um, implementing various tools. Um, next quarter that will give us those measurements as part of any contact. So um, as, as you'd expect, you can any email, phone call, or live chat would be followed up with a, um, you can rate the, the, the contact. So we can get more, um, more accurate measures of that. Um, and some of those will also be rolled out to stores so that we can do cross-channel. Um, and the second point is that what we're trying to do as part as part of this idea that everybody is driving towards the same goal is that th those are the metrics that we're using rather than traditional sales metrics. Um, so really to ensure that it doesn't matter where the customer transacts, if, if everybody is, um, if everyone is incentivized on satisfaction rather than sales, then you drive the right behaviors. So. Um, it's critical for us to get that right, um, and we're still in our journey, if I was being totally honest. Great. Thank you. And another question from the floor? Um, I think with a hand over there. Yeah. Thanks. Let's get a microphone to you. Hi, yeah, you're right. I'm Laura from Rice Media. Um, you mentioned earlier on about that you started doing PPC, SEO, social. I just wondered which one is the one that brings you the most traffic and the most quality traffic out of the three? Like, what's the hierarchy of the three? Yeah, good question. Um, so they're all, they're, I mean, they're all so different for us, and, and we think, and they all play different roles in different parts of the customer journey. Um, so we know that um, Instagram is, is really important, at, um, very high up the funnel in terms of brand awareness. Um, but we know that we don't tend to see any direct activity for it, mainly because it's relatively difficult to click through to various places. Um, but um, it, we know that it drives lots of contacts and sentiment, etc. So that's probably um, that's really key for us, but represents a very small proportion of our social traffic. Whereas Pinterest, on the other hand, is 50% of our social traffic, um, and is and is really key for us because of the interior designers that we work for and the boards that they share. So um, it's really critical that, that things like rich pins are set up correctly, that we're monitoring, tagging, hashtagging, et cetera. So um, Pinterest has been great for us. We, d um, we do a lot of, um, we're beginning to do a lot of work with House, which is an interior design social media, and that has, been, has proven relatively successful. Um, PPC is um, still um, fundamental. Um, it makes up a big proportion of our traffic. We have a very positive ROI on it still. Um, and we're able to drive um, um, really good volume. Um, so that, that is also still pretty critical. Um, so I would, um, we think about them all in uh, together in conjunction. And because we're very, very um, specific about the searches or the clients that we're going after, that actually we tend to 
Um, it's not a question of inventory, if that makes sense. Um, it's a question of making sure that we're optimizing all of them correctly. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah OK. I wonder whether I could just build upon that. Um, my area is trying to identify purchase intent. That's what we do with Advantageous. And I wonder whether that's something which um, you're looking at with the digital channels. Are you able to see from um, PPC, putting some data in, um, and identify when people are at the right point and then hit them with the right message? Yes. So, um, so we don't at the at the moment we don't do that um, in a, in any kind of sophisticated way, um, and um, but we do know um, at which point. Yeah, the life cycle is long, and we know at which points um, the channels make sense to to engage with them. Um, what's interesting for us is that further down the channel, further down the customer journey, actually we want to hand off a lot of the digital touch points to human touch points. Um, and it's how we do that in a not creepy and, um, and effective way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, getting that balance right between the creepiness and the yeah. kind of exciting yeah. ad tech is always a balance, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Thanks. Um, another question from the floor. Um, I thought I saw a hand over here before, but that could have just been someone scratching their head. Oh, we've got a question over here. If we could, please. Good effort getting across the, uh, the benches there. Well done. Hi, Sarah. My name is Priya Iyer, and you talked about the human touch, which I'm really interested in. Um, have you, we, we heard a lot in yesterday's talks about uh, that personalization and bringing the human back uh, yeah. into yeah. online. Are you thinking about the human touch online, not just in your store, but um, talking to your customers online and things like that? And what do you do in that area? Yeah, so um, definitely the interesting part, so when I did some um, test orders and um, um, when I was um, interviewing as, you know, as part of the process to join the company, and I, um, and I, call, I called to understand the refund policy or whatever it was, and, um, and I was kind of getting, like, I think I, I recognized the, res the receptionist from head office um, who I first went to, and then I got popped around the stores. So it was all about... And then it was directly to the showroom, but that that w didn't seem quite right because I didn't live near a showroom, and I actually just wanted to engage with online. Um, but there was no kind of centralized point. So we we have invested very heavily in customer services, um, and in platforms, um, Zendesk, whatever you know, live chat. So um, we know that um, we want to move a lot of the communications from email and telephone into live chat. And we know that there are various trigger points when it makes sense to have someone reassure about that high purchase point. Um, so that's working. Um, that's working well for us. Um, that we recognise um, when someone has something in their wish list or in their basket, or they've dwelled on the checkout page too long. That we can reintroduce somebody who can um, provide technical information, delivery information can um, remind people about our try at home service um, and then they'll follow them through that step of the way and and we find quite a lot of the times that then people will pick up the phone and actually um, they the conversion might happen over the phone rather than online um, and and that's obvious that's fine with us so yes I think um, we're we're certainly looking at reintroducing that human touch at the right point great thank you I think it's been fascinating to hear yeah. your case study there of how you've been using all these digital channels and digital platforms to drive your business forward in that transformation, um, when a lot of the other examples have been um, about trying to get that direct sale, whereas yours has been really about showcasing the product and bringing that tactile and physical experience to life. Yeah. Um, so, Sarah, I'd like to thank you very much yeah, thank you, thank for, your, you. for your presentation. Thanks.